Welcome to ITRON's Inspire 2024. We are absolutely delighted that you've chosen to spend uh, the next couple of days with us. This event wouldn't be the signature event that it is for us without all of your support. Now, this is the 42nd year that we've done this event. And over those years, yeah, I think the name changed a couple of times. We added a few more seats in the room. The, uh, Hurricane came through one year, so some things got clearly changed during, during those 42 years, but one thing that really hasn't changed is, is the thing that makes the event very, very special for me, and that's the fact that we can all come together, we can share experiences, and we can learn from one another. It is that key aspect of learning from one another which makes our industry and this event so special. You know, every time I walk out from uh, behind those, those curtains out onto a stage. I'm always kind of amazed and humbled that there's actually an audience sitting there and expecting, okay, let me recalibrate, hoping that I'll say something remotely interesting during the remarks that, that I give. But as an engineer growing up, I never really thought much beyond the edge of, of the C drive to, uh, to what would come next. It's, it's one of life's mysteries as to how I find myself standing on this, this stage. But what isn't really all that much uh, of a mystery is it doesn't matter if you're standing here or sitting there, there's something that we actually can learn when, when we come together and, and we have these, these conversations. If you permit me, I, I want to relay a little bit of a story, and I, I promise there, there is a point. Several years ago, uh, I was attending a very, very large industry conference. I think six-figure number of, of uh, attendees at the conference. It's held at enormous convention centers where, standing from the stage, you can't even see the back wall of the, of the room. It's like that warehouse at the end of the Indiana Jones movie. And the keynote speaker for this uh, session that, that I'm about to relay was a, uh, a former cabinet-level secretary from the U.S. government, a pretty household name at, at the time. And um, he gets up on stage, and he's a minute or two into his remarks, and um, he kind of stops and smiles at, in a wry way at the styrofoam cup in his hand. And um, he says, um, last year, I attended and spoke this, this exact same conference, and uh, I flew on a private plane, and there was a limo waiting for me when I, I, I landed at the private terminal who took me to the hotel, and when I got to the hotel lobby, there was someone waiting. They had already checked me in and handed my keys. The next morning, uh, another limo picked me up and whisked me off to, uh, to the event venue, and they brought me in the side door and into the green room, and somebody handed me a cup of coffee in a beautiful ceramic mug. This year, by contrast, I flew commercial, checked myself into the hotel after riding in a taxi, took another taxi to the venue this morning, found my way to the green room by coming in the front door, and, and when I got backstage, I asked a rather harried stagehand where the coffee machine was, and, and uh, he pointed to a pot in the corner, and, and uh, I poured myself a cup of coffee in this styrofoam cup. And the lesson in that story for, for him was that ceramic mug was never meant for him. It was meant for his title. And if I take a moment and step back from that and think about it, what, what he really meant by, by telling the story, I think it is certainly something I subscribe to, which is being humble and grateful for every opportunity that you have, but at the same time, seizing that opportunity and making the best of it whenever that ceramic mug lands in, in your hands. And I think that metaphor, that idea, applies well to our industry today. And specifically, I think the equivalent of that ceramic mug is the power of the data that is in our hands today. There's, there's treasure inside of, of, that, uh, of that asset, and we need to be, be able to take advantage of it in a very full and robust way. So over these years, over the last decade or more, we have added more and more digital assets to our collective capability. We have uh, having those assets providing more and more data, and inside of that data is the opportunity to 
increase our efficiency, improve the quality of service, improve resiliency and reliability in the services that we provide, address sustainability and the associated challenges that go along with it. All of that is, is possible. And if you take away one thing from my, my talk today, it is let's, I, I urge all of us to, to move uh, in the direction to take advantage of, of that asset. The cold, hard truth is we're never going to have fewer digital assets than we have at this moment. The amount of CPU cycles at our disposal is, is never going to be fewer than they are today. The level and the amount of data that is in our hands is only going to grow exponentially. And if I even become a little bit uh, blunt about it, the AI and machine learning algorithms that exist are the dumbest they're ever going to be today. It only gets better from here forward. And if you add up those, or multiply those four dimensions that I just talked about, the power and the insights that we can pull out of the data only increases with every day from here going forward, taking advantage of that, that there's treasure, uh, there's gold in those hills. So for, for example, I, I would talk a little bit about uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's all over the news and the press today. And I think there's three ways that we think about using it from an ITRON perspective, whether it is on data that, and, and services we provide to our customers or whether it's internal operations. The, the three ways that I think are important to think about, number one is the idea of making us as humans much more efficient and productive. Uh, in terms of, of what we actually do. I think that the Microsoft terminology of, of co-pilot is the right way to, uh, to think about it. it. It captures the essence of the idea. As a software engineer, you can use it to help augment your ability to write software. Uh, as a manager uh, or a leader in an organization, you can speak to a large language model and have it generate a report to pull information out of, uh, out of your data. If your meter data management, uh, IE, is running on, on Microsoft Azure, use that interface to pull information out uh, of the data uh, through the, in, the uh, integration that, uh, that we've done with Microsoft uh, as an example. Uh, so that would be track number one. Track number two is, is really when you get to an operational stage on things. Uh, operational data is, is, is something that you, you got to be able to provide resilient and reliable services. And, and here you want the algorithms that you work with to be uh, deterministic, not stochastic. You, you can't have uh, random uh, output on that. So presented with the same set of, of inputs, it's got to produce the same result every time. Here you can think about things like anomaly detection or, or, or some of the models that you can use to understand ranges on, on forecasting going forward. And the third area that you could use is something much more probabilistic, a generative AI kind of algorithm. And there, it would be something like a, a digital twin, a what-if analysis where you can really start to explore possibilities. But all three of those tracks, from, from the co-pilot idea to the deterministic, uh, to the generative side of things, all of that is alive and well and grounds for us to, to share, learn, and, and discuss during our days ahead. There's an awful lot to be done, and, and we're just scratching the surface. And that's probably good because there's a lot more to be done. We're up against some pretty significant challenges. You've heard me speak about these things in, in years gone by. There are infrastructure challenges. The average age of water infrastructure in the United States is over 50 years old. If you ever lived in a 50-year-old house, fixing up that plumbing isn't all that much fun. You've got situations where more and more cybersecurity attacks by the millions uh, or physical attacks on infrastructure uh, are up uh, more than double from the year 22 to 23. You have the changing profile on the generation side of things where you have more large scale renewables coming online, which is terrific from a sustainability point of view, but it absolutely does create some, uh, some loading issues as, as there are days when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. How do you balance out supply and demand and that kind of a situation? We also have to account for the fact that Absolute load is growing. Um, from the year 2000 to maybe 2020, electricity demand at the highest level in the United States was kind of flattish uh, if you look at it in, in aggregate. There was just as much offshoring of manufacturing and efficiency uh, to offset some growth that was inside of there. 
what we look at today for the next 30 years is a very, very different profile. And whether you want to argue it's 2% compounded annual growth or 7% compounded annual growth over the next 30 years, it's a very different trajectory that we have to account for driven by things like the electrification of transportation, uh, more and more data centers coming online, reshoring of manufacturing. All of that will change the load growth profile that we have. Lest we forget, we've got transmission challenges. Uh, most reports that are out there talk about the time that it takes to get transmission built. Uh, just look at the total amount that we need. Estimates are as high as 152 million kilometers of transmission that is uh, distance that is needed uh, in, the, in the, a global scale of, over the next uh, 30 years. That's only the distance from the Earth to the sun in, in one continuous line. So there's a lot to be done. And at the edge of the network, you'll have distributed energy resources coming online, which create point loads and a lot of uh, supply demand imbalance out at the edge. All of that is happening on the infrastructure side. Environmental challenges are very, very real. It doesn't matter where on the planet you may be. Uh, floods and fires and, and storms uh, are, are very real. On average, the amount of damage in the United States has been about $18 billion per year over the last five years. Uh, we crushed that this year, and I don't mean that in a good way. Hurricane Helene uh, by itself is, is at least $50 billion, and some estimates as high as $200 billion of total carnage caused by, by that storm. And now we have uh, Milton heading towards the west coast of Florida as, as we speak. These things are absolutely happening more and more frequently as we have population centers that are moving towards the coasts. I'm sure that, that uh, we're up for some more challenges in being able to provide resilient, reliable services in that kind of environment. And the last bucket I would talk about really has to do with societal changes. Our tolerance for service outages has never been lower. There's only 5 billion or so daily users of the internet uh, around the globe. And we've all been trained by that experience to be able to get information in real time at, whenever we want and understand how we are using things. And, and when you start to combine that and think about how we as consumers work with our utilities today, we don't have that same level of, of service more often than not. And that creates an enormous opportunity and a challenge. These things are real and they are accelerating. So you heard my pitch on why there's hope, there's, there's more and more data, there's more and more assets, there's more and more we can do. Yep, we got some real problems to challenge, to, to challenge us and, and uh, figure out what we can do next. Let's start to talk about the solutions uh, of, of what happens. And, and here, Marina set it up nicely. The idea of intelligence at the edge, we think is foundational to being able to cope with all those challenges. Uh, there's, there's no doubt there, there are more and more things we can do. And it doesn't matter if we're talking water, where you would want to have less loss. Uh, so you can think about automating water systems and look for real and apparent losses. We could be talking about gas systems, where you would network your, your gas territory. And again, you can gain efficiencies in, in terms of how you are doing the basics, but you can also add value-added services like methane detection, automatic alarms, being able to, to shut off gas uh, remotely to prevent a, a safety incident from ever even taking form. In the smart city domain, you can build a network to uh, automate your streetlight controls, uh, gain the efficiencies of, uh, of LED there, but once you've got that canopy network built, a whole host of applications become within your reach to be able to do things like uh, parking and, and uh, uh, understand what's happening with, uh, with street furniture, uh, asset control, understand uh, pollution and air quality, uh, noise levels. A lot of uh, incidental applications uh, can come in the city domain itself, and you can also use that same network to provide services uh, to other tenants that are in the area. Let's use this network to read water meters or, or uh, uh, to do things with, uh, with other parts of, of uh, city constituent in that same area by using that multi-tenant capability. And certainly in the electricity space, it is uh, uh, most 
uh, exciting from our perspective, where there is a lot of innovation fueled by a lot of that demand growth that I talked about earlier. Balancing supply and demand at the edge, uh, being able to do that in a very agile way so that you can download an agent into that endpoint to be able to look for certain signals and take actions based on an if-then-else kind of, of model. You can use it to, uh, to understand what's going on with vegetation. You can use it to uh, decrease your, your restoration time after a large high pressure event. A lot of applications come from understanding what is out in that distribution network, being able to use a common set of assets to understand what's happening so it's efficient from a capital perspective, uh, but it accretes with tremendous value in terms of the quality of service that you provide. <clears throat> All of those applications that I just talked about and rattled off, if we're talking electricity, gas, water, smart cities, they all have similar building blocks. And, and it's, it's pretty straightforward stuff when you start to, to break it down. First, you need connectivity. You've got to be able to connect to that thing out at the edge of, of the network. You've got to be able to do that in a secure and robust and reliable way. Think about that connection that you've got to your AMI meter today. That same connection can be used for a lot of different uh, things. Number two is you've got to understand what you are connecting to and get some visibility. Am I connecting to a battery? What's the state of charge in that battery? Am I connected to a uh, electric vehicle charger, what's happening in that local area? Uh, so understanding what you're connected to and have visibility to it. And number three is being able to control it. Turn it on, turn it off, rate shift, depending on, uh, on what's actually happening. And you can start to combine those three things, combine with the power of, of the data to be able to provide real value across the entire network of operations out at the edge. And, and putting all of these things together, visibility, control, uh, is, is what uh, we have been investing heavily in over more than a decade. But at the end of the day, it's going to take the entire community, the entire ecosystem within the sound of my voice to put all of this together and realize the service. And that's why we're truly excited that you're here with us today. So I, I, I've gone through and, and made my pitch here as, as to why I think this is really important, having agile infrastructure that you can provide extra services out at the edge, being able to do that in a way that's multi-purpose and multi-tenant uh, and, and pull all of this together. But I think it's probably more interesting to be able to show you rather than tell you. So I'm gonna walk you through a, a short demo if you were with us last year, you remember Tim Driscoll and I uh, did a uh, demo and talked about transformer monitoring. Um, this year, we're gonna take that same fundamental capability of connectivity, visibility, and control, and we're gonna use it inside of the house. So let's talk about what it looks like from the, the consumer side uh, overall, uh, from, from the panel of the house and, and the services you can pull out of it. So here's the setup. Electric vehicles are on the rise. I know you read a whole bunch of things today that says, ah, electric vehicles, they're not happening. Everybody's cutting their forecasts. Uh, uh, it, it's just not working. Eh, the fact of the matter is uh, maybe we've gone from 100% growth to only 25% growth uh, year over year. So uh, year to date, electric vehicles are up 14% year over year in terms of sales. Uh, hybrids are up 28%. ICE vehicles, internal combustion vehicles, are down 3% year over year. So it, it, it's absolutely still happening uh, and will continue to happen in the years ahead. So let's take a scenario. We'll, uh, we'll talk about a particular consumer. Let's call him Poor Planning Paul. Well, Poor Planning Paul went and, uh, and bought his uh, exciting new electric vehicle and uh, he just got home and he realized that it's going to take him uh, about 18 hours to charge up the car uh, by using a, a level one. Just you know, stick it into that little uh, uh, socket that, that's in your wall, the, the 110 volt uh, uh, circuit that, that's in, inside of his house. So um, uh, he, he's trying to figure out what to do. 18 hour charge time doesn't really sound like the world that he wants to live in. So he starts investigating what he needs to do, talking to his utility, talking to uh, electricians, and uh, what they tell him is uh, he's got a 100 amp panel in the house and uh, he's gonna have to upgrade that, that panel. 
um, the service to the house isn't going to really give them 200 amp service, so the utility would have to uh, run a new circuit uh, to the house itself. Um, so uh, poor planning Paul is now uh, trying to figure out what to do next, and how about if we play a little game to figure out uh, what should happen. Now, I, I forget the, the uh, who was the host of Price is Right? Was it Bob Barker or Wink Martindale? Bob Barker, okay, very good. I forgot the fellow's name. So I'm gonna do my best Bob Barker here. And um, let, let's, let's see what we can do to, uh, to uh, step through the, was it the big showcase? I forget what it was, uh, but anyway. So what's behind door number, no, door, door number one? So door number one is the scenario of, ah, I'm just gonna use that uh, 110 uh, volt uh, uh, circuit. I'm, I'm just going to, uh, to plug it in and deal with 18 hour charge times, except I still have a lot of range anxiety. I'm really worried about uh, running out of fuel uh, on, and being stuck on the side of the road. So let's call that uh, uh, choice number one. Choice number two would be the case of, you know, I, I can't deal with that range anxiety, I'm just gonna have to return it, and I'm going back to my 1985 pickup truck. What it doesn't have in style, it lacks in comfort, okay? But, but this, this is my, my choice number two. And uh, how about door number three? Door number three is, uh, I, I found uh, Sneaky Pete, the rogue electrician. We're gonna do some uh, off the books uh, uh, work, and uh, oh my. Uh, okay, well, all right, so, so, all right, enough with Sneaky Pete, that's not a really great plan either. So door number one, two, and three, and those were my choices in the showcase. That doesn't sound like great fun, but uh, fortunately, and you knew there was a punchline here, fortunately, if you can still see me through the smoke and the haze, is there is a door number four, and, and door number four really is starting to use grid edge intelligence uh, and the idea of being able to download applications uh, into uh, to the endpoint to be able to help solve these problems. So uh, jokes aside, what does that really look like and, and how might we be able to, uh, to do it? So let's start over. Um, forget poor planning, Paul. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna start from the beginning here and uh, we are going to, uh, to bring home that uh, fancy new EV. And this time, it is brilliant Betty who has, uh, who has uh, purchased the vehicle. Now, she, she's done her research, she knows what she wants to do, so uh, she, she absolutely logs on to, uh, to the local utility website and understands the situation. 100 amp panel in the house uh, and uh, limited service that, that uh, comes to the door, so uh, what are your options? You can spend that $50,000 or, or whatever the number is to, uh, to do it the old fashioned way, or you can enroll in the dynamic EV charging management program, which utilizes the grid edge technology that, uh, that, that I'm, I'm trying to outline here. So what does that look like? So let's suppose the, uh, the, the endpoint on the side of our house is not one of the 11 million that we already have out in the field today. Uh, so uh, there may be a hardware change required to make that endpoint DI capable. Once you've got that in place, you download the application into uh, to that endpoint from the utility side. You enroll in the, uh, the program from the, uh, the, the customer side. So uh, the app goes on the phone to be able to, to do it. You get the licensed electrician, not rogue electrician, Sneaky Pete, um, but uh, you install the, uh, the uh, level two charger in the house and you connect that to, uh, to the endpoint itself uh, through that dynamic programming, uh, 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 EV charging program that, uh, that I outlined uh, a moment ago. And what does it really look like? So uh, up now on the screen, you see two sides of the same coin. You, you see the, the I'll call it the iPhone screen on the app, and you see what uh, is happening on the utility side itself. And, and the highlighted item on the utility side is, is the address of Brilliant Betty's uh, home. So she just came into the garage, uh, the car isn't plugged in, it's not charging, and she's got about, uh, let's call it 24% of, of her charge left, it's available range of maybe 74 miles. 
so uh, w the, the house itself right now within the 100 amp budget uh, on the panel uh, is consuming about six amps of, uh, of power for, for various things inside of, of the, the house overall. So call that the, the rest of the home. So she plugs in the car and it begins charging and, and that's about a, a, a 60 amp ad. It's charging at, at full rate. And you can see on the app side now, um, we are talking about a six and a half hour charge time. So by the time she wakes up in the morning and wants to take that road trip, uh, this thing will, will be charged. It, it's got 74 miles today, uh, but uh, within six and a half hours, the whole thing will be, be topped up. It's a hot afternoon, so turning on the, the air conditioning to, uh, to cool down the, the house itself. And uh, as that air conditioning kicked on, let's call that 40 amps uh, of the budget, uh, 40 plus 60 plus six, well, okay, we would have exceeded the, the, uh, the budget of what we had, so what happens is uh, the endpoint and the level two charger communicate to live within the 100 amp uh, uh, budget uh, of the panel, and you downshifted, so now you're charging at, uh, at 54 amps to the car. Uh, the charge time has, has extended a little bit, so we're talking 7.7 .7 hours now versus uh, the, uh, the six and a half that we had before, but you're living within the budget. You didn't spend that $50,000. Car's still gonna be ready to go uh, by the time you get there uh, and ready to go first thing tomorrow morning. So it's time to make the, uh, the dinner. So uh, I, I don't know what we're having for dinner. Let's call it macaroni and cheese, but uh, we, we start uh, cooking dinner, and again, the load inside of the house goes up uh, uh, some more, and again, the, the uh, system would work within itself in an autonomous manner to be able to downshift the, uh, uh, the rate of charging to make it fit within that budget. Uh, charge time went up, but nonetheless, uh, you're still living within the panel and, and you're operating as you normally would inside of the home without actually having to think about uh, managing all this complexity as the consumer. So uh, dinner is all done, air conditioning still on, rate of charge can go back up, um, still charging. Now it's time for bed, uh, it, it's cooled off, the, the air conditioner kicks off, and you can go back to, uh, to charging uh, at, at the full rate. So by the next morning, you're, you're all ready to go. But what you've seen there with that series of screenshots, how the grid edge intelligence can work, how that power of data solves a real world problem from the perspective of, of Brilliant Betty, the consumer, um, but it also worked on behalf of, of the utility to, to live within that existing power. You can apply that same capability on the grid side to improve efficiency. You could do it at the transformer level. You can even uh, potentially do it at the feeder level by adding up all of the, these benefits and understanding how to dynamically control uh, the, the power and the use of data out at the edge. In this particular case, uh, the power and the data was figuratively and literally charging up the car, and I think that's just a great, great way for me to, to wrap up my remarks today. So leave you with the idea is there's power in the data. Let's put it to use. Let's do it in a way that uh, takes advantage of agile assets that, that can move and change uh, with your, your needs, and let's do this together across the full ecosystem. So thank you so much for, for your attention and your time today. Uh, it's truly been my pleasure to spend some minutes with you.